This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg. Letters of Two Brides by Honoré de Balzac. Letter 12. Mademoiselle de Chaulieu to Madame de l'Estrade. February. At nine o'clock this morning, sweetheart, my father was announced in my rooms. I was up and dressed. I found him solemnly seated beside the fire in the drawing-room, looking more thoughtful than usual. He pointed to the armchair opposite to him. Divining his meaning, I sank into it with a gravity which so well aped his that he could not refrain from smiling, though the smile was dashed with melancholy. "'You are quite a match for your grandmother in quick wittedness,' he said. "'Come, father, don't play the courtier here,' I replied. "'You want something from me.' He rose, visibly agitated, and talked to me for half an hour. This conversation, dear, really ought to be preserved. As soon as he had gone, I sat down to my table, and tried to recall his words. This is the first time that I have seen my father revealing his inner thoughts. He began by flattering me, and he did not do it badly. I was bound to be grateful to him for having understood and appreciated me. Armand, he said, I was quite mistaken in you, and you have agreeably surprised me. When you arrived from the convent I took you for an average young girl, ignorant and not particularly intelligent, easily to be bought off with gewgaws and ornaments, and with little turn for reflection. "'You are complimentary to young girls, father.' "'Oh, there is no such thing as youth nowadays,' he said, with the air of a diplomat. "'Your mind is amazingly open. You take everything at its proper worth. Your clear-sightedness is extraordinary. There is no hoodwinking you. You pass for being blind, and all the time you have laid your hand on causes, while other people are still puzzling over effects. In short, you are a minister in petticoats, the only person here capable of understanding me. It follows, then, that if I have any sacrifice to ask from you, it is only to yourself I can turn for help in persuading you. I am therefore going to explain to you, quite frankly, my former plans, to which I still adhere. In order to recommend them to you, I must show that they are connected with feelings of a very high order, and I shall thus be obliged to enter into political questions of the greatest importance to the kingdom, which might be wearisome to any one less intelligent than you are. When you have heard me, I hope you will take time for consideration, six months if necessary. You are entirely your own mistress, and if you decline to make the sacrifice I ask, I shall bow to your decision and trouble you no further. This preface, my sweetheart, made me really serious, and I said, "'Speak, father.' "'Here, then, is the deliverance of the statesman. "'My child, France is in a very critical position, "'which is understood only by the king and a few superior minds. "'But the king is a head without arms. "'The great nobles, who are in the secret of the danger, have no authority over the men whose cooperation is needful in order to bring about a happy result. These men, cast up by popular election, refuse to lend themselves as instruments. Even the able men among them carry on the work of pulling down society, instead of helping us to strengthen the edifice. In a word, there are only two parties, the party of Marius and the party of Sulla, I am for Sulla against Marius. This, roughly speaking, is our position. To go more into details, the revolution is still active. It is embedded in the law and written on the soil. It fills people's minds. The danger is all the greater because the greater number of the king's councillors, seeing it destitute of armed forces and of money, believe it completely vanquished. The king is an able man and not easily blinded, but from day to day he is won over by his brother's partisans, who want to hurry things on. He has not two years to live, and thinks more of a peaceful deathbed than of anything else. 
Shall I tell you, my child, which is the most destructive of all the consequences entailed by the revolution? You would never guess. In Louis the Sixteenth, the revolution has decapitated every head of a family. The family has ceased to exist. We have only individuals. In their desire to become a nation, Frenchmen have abandoned the idea of empire. In proclaiming the equal rights of all children to their father's inheritance, they have killed the family spirit, and created the state treasury. But all this has paved the way for weakened authority, for the blind force of the masses, for the decay of art, and the supremacy of individual interests, and has left the road open to the foreign invader. We stand between two policies, either to found the state on the basis of the family, or to rest it on individual interest, in other words, between democracy and aristocracy, between free discussion and obedience, between Catholicism and religious indifference. I am among the few who are resolved to oppose what is called the people, and that in the people's true interest. It is not now a question of feudal rights, as fools are told, nor of rank. It is a question of the state, and of the existence of France. The country which does not rest on the foundation of paternal authority cannot be stable. That is the foot of the ladder of responsibility and subordination, which has for its summit the king. The king stands for us all. To die for the king is to die for oneself, for one's family, which, like the kingdom, cannot die. All animals have certain instincts. The instinct of man is for family life. A country is strong which consists of wealthy families, every member of whom is interested in defending a common treasure. It is weak when composed of scattered individuals, to whom it matters little whether they obey seven or one, a Russian or a Corsican, so long as each keeps his own plot of land, blind in their wretched egotism, to the fact that the day is coming when this too will be torn from them. Terrible calamities are in store for us, in case our party fails. Nothing will be left but penal or fiscal laws, your money or your life. The most generous nation on the earth will have ceased to obey the call of noble instincts. Wounds past curing will have been fostered and aggravated, an all-pervading jealousy being the first. Then the upper classes will be submerged, equality of desire will be taken for equality of strength, True distinction, even when proved and recognized, will be threatened by the advancing tide of middle-class prejudice. It was possible to choose one man out of a thousand, but, amongst three millions, discrimination becomes impossible, when all are moved by the same ambitions, and attired in the same livery of mediocrity. No foresight will warn this victorious horde of that other terrible horde, soon to be arrayed against them in the peasant proprietors, in other words, twenty million acres of land, alive, stirring, arguing, deaf to reason, insatiable of appetite, obstructing progress, masters in their brute force. But, said I, interrupting my father, what can I do to help the state? I feel no vocation for playing Joan of Arc in the interests of the family, or for finding a martyr's block in the convent." "'You are a little hussy,' cried my father. "'If I speak sensibly to you, you are full of jokes. "'When I jest, you talk like an ambassadress.' "'Love lives on contrasts,' was my reply. "'And he laughed till the tears stood in his eyes. "'You will reflect on what I have told you. "'You will do justice to the large and confiding spirit "'in which I have broached the matter, "'and possibly events may assist my plans.' I know that, so far as you are concerned, they are injurious and unfair, and this is the reason why I appeal for your sanction of them less to your heart and your imagination than to your reason. I have found more judgment and common sense in you than in any one I know. You flatter yourself, I said with a smile, for I am every inch your child. In short, he went on, one must be logical. You can't have the end without the means, 
and it is our duty to set an example to others. From all this I deduce that you ought not to have money of your own till your younger brother is provided for, and I want to employ the whole of your inheritance in purchasing an estate for him to go with the title. But, I said, you won't interfere with my living in my own fashion, and enjoying life if I leave you my fortune. Provided, he replied, that your view of life does not conflict with the family honour, reputation, and, I may add, glory. Come, come, I cried, what has become of my excellent judgment? There is not in all France, he said with bitterness, a man who would take for wife a daughter of one of our noblest families, without a dowry, and bestow one on her. If such a husband could be found, it would be among the class of rich parvenus. On this point I belong to the eleventh century. And I also, I said, but why despair? Are there no aged peers? You are an apt scholar, Louise, he exclaimed. Then he left me, smiling, and kissing my hand. I received your letter this very morning, and it led me to contemplate that abyss into which you say that I may fall. A voice within seemed to utter the same warning. So I took my precautions. Henares, my dear, dares to look at me, and his eyes are disquieting. They inspire me with what I can only call an unreasoning dread. Such a man ought no more to be looked at than a frog. He is ugly and fascinating." For two days I have been hesitating whether to tell my father point-blank that I want no more Spanish lessons, and have Henares sent about his business. But in spite of all my brave resolutions I feel that the horrible sensation which comes over me when I see that man has become necessary to me. I say to myself, once more, and then I will speak. His voice, my dear, is sweetly thrilling. His speaking is just like La Fodor's singing. His manners are simple, entirely free from affectation. And what teeth! Just now, as he was leaving, he seemed to divine the interest I take in him, and made a gesture, oh, most respectfully, as though to take my hand and kiss it, then checked himself, apparently terrified at his own boldness, and the chasm he had been on the point of bridging. There was the merest suggestion of all this, but I understood it, and smiled, for nothing is more pathetic than to see the frank impulse of an inferior checking itself abashed. The love of a plebeian for a girl of noble birth implies such courage. My smile emboldened him. The poor fellow looked blindly about for his hat. He seemed determined not to find it, and I handed it to him with perfect gravity." His eyes were wet with unshed tears. It was a mere passing moment, yet a world of facts and ideas were contained in it. We understood each other so well that, on a sudden, I held out my hand for him to kiss. Possibly this was equivalent to telling him that love might bridge the interval between us. Well, I cannot tell what moved me to do it. Griffith had her back turned as I proudly extended my little white paw. I felt the fire of his lips, tempered by two big tears. Oh, my love, I lay in my armchair, nerveless, dreamy. I was happy, and I cannot explain to you how or why. What I felt only a poet could express. My condescension, which fills me with shame now, seemed to me then something to be proud of. He had fascinated me, that is my one excuse. FRIDAY This man is really very handsome. He talks admirably, and has remarkable intellectual power. My dear, he is a very bousset in force and persuasiveness when he explains the mechanism, not only of the Spanish tongue, but also of human thought, and of all language. His mother tongue seems to be French. When I expressed surprise at this, he replied that he came to France when quite a boy, following the King of Spain, to Valencé. What has passed within this enigmatic being? He is no longer the same man. 
He came, dressed quite simply, but just as any gentleman would for a morning walk. He put forth all his eloquence and flashed wit, like rays from a beacon, all through the lesson. Like a man roused from lethargy, he revealed to me a new world of thoughts. He told me the story of some poor devil of a valet who gave up his life for a single glance from a queen of Spain. "'What could he do but die?' I exclaimed. This delighted him, and he looked at me in a way which was truly alarming. In the evening I went to a ball at the Duchesse de Lenoncourt's. The Prince de Talleyrand happened to be there, and I got M. de Vandenesse, a charming young man, to ask him whether, among the guests at his country place in 1809, he remembered any one of the name of Henares. Vandenesse reported the Prince's reply, word for word, as follows. Henares is the Moorish name of the Soria family, who are, they say, descendants of the Abencerages, converted to Christianity. The old duke and his two sons were with the king. The eldest, the present duke de Soria, has just had all his property, titles, and dignities confiscated by King Ferdinand, who in this way avenges a long-standing feud. The duke made a huge mistake in consenting to form a constitutional ministry with Valdez. Happily he escaped from Cadiz before the arrival of the Duc d'Angelême, who, with the best will in the world, could not have saved him from the king's wrath. This information gave me much food for reflection. I cannot describe to you the suspense in which I passed the time till my next lesson, which took place this morning. During the first quarter of an hour I examined him closely, debating inwardly whether he were duke or commoner, without being able to come to any conclusion. He seemed to read my fancies as they arose, and to take pleasure in thwarting them. At last I could endure it no longer. Putting down my book suddenly, I broke off the translation I was making of it aloud, and said to him in Spanish, "'You are deceiving us. You are no poor middle-class liberal. You are the Duc de Soria.' Mademoiselle, he replied, with a gesture of sorrow, unhappily, I am not the Duc de Soria. I felt all the despair with which he uttered the words, unhappily. Ah, my dear, never should I have conceived it possible to throw so much meaning and passion into a single word. His eyes had dropped, and he dared no longer look at me. Monsieur de Talleyrand, I said, in whose house you spent four years of exile, declares that any one bearing the name of Henares must either be the late Duc de Soria or a lackey. He looked at me with eyes like two black burning coals, at once blazing and ashamed. The man might have been in the torture chamber. All he said was, My father was in truth the servant of the King of Spain. Griffith could make nothing of this sort of lesson, an awkward silence followed each question and answer. "'In one word,' I said, "'are you a nobleman or not?' "'You know that in Spain even beggars are noble.' This reticence provoked me. Since the last lesson I had given play to my imagination in the little practical joke. I had drawn an ideal portrait of the man whom I should wish for my lover in a letter which I designed giving to him to translate.' So far I had only put Spanish into French, not French into Spanish. I pointed this out to him, and begged Griffith to bring me the last letter I had received from a friend of mine. I shall find out, I thought, from the effect my sketch has on him, what sort of blood runs in his veins. I took the paper from Griffith's hands, saying, "'Let me see if I have copied it rightly.' For it was all in my writing." I handed him the paper, or, if you will, the snare, and I watched him while he read as follows. He who is to win my heart, my dear, must be harsh and unbending with men, but gentle to women. His eagle eye must have power to kell with a single glance the least approach to ridicule. He will have a pitying smile for those who would jeer at sacred things, above all, at that poetry of the heart, without which life would be but a dreary commonplace. 
I have the greatest scorn for those who would rob us of the living fountain of religious beliefs, so rich in solace. His faith, therefore, should have the simplicity of a child, though united to the firm conviction of an intelligent man, who has examined the foundations of his creed. His fresh and original way of looking at things must be entirely free from affectation or desire to show off. His words will be few and fit, and his mind so richly stored that he cannot possibly become a bore to himself any more than to others. All his thoughts must have a high and chivalrous character, without alloy of self-seeking, while his actions should be marked by a total absence of interested or sordid motives. Any weak points he may have will arise from the very elevation of his views above those of the common herd, for in every respect I would have him superior to his age. Ever mindful of the delicate attentions due to the weak, he will be gentle to all women, but not prone lightly to fall in love with any, for love will seem to him too serious to turn into a game. Thus it might happen that he would spend his life in ignorance of true love, while all the time possessing those qualities most fitted to inspire it. But if ever he find the ideal woman who has haunted his waking dreams, if he meet with a nature capable of understanding his own, one who could fill his soul and pour sunlight over his life, could shine as a star through the mists of this chill and gloomy world, lend fresh charm to existence, and draw music from the hitherto silent chords of his being, needless to say, he would recognize and welcome his good fortune. And she, too, would be happy. Never by word or look would he wound the tender heart which abandoned itself to him, with the blind trust of a child reposing in its mother's arms. For were the vision shattered, it would be the wreck of her inner life. To the mighty waters of love she would confide her all. The man I picture must belong, in expression, in attitude, in gait, in his way of performing alike the smallest and the greatest actions, to that race of the truly great who are always simple and natural. He need not be good-looking, but his hands must be beautiful. His upper lip will curl with a careless ironic smile for the general public, whilst he reserves for those he loves the heavenly, radiant glance in which he puts his soul. "'Will mademoiselle allow me,' he said in Spanish, in a voice full of agitation, to keep this writing in memory of her. This is the last lesson I shall have the honour of giving her, and that which I have just received in these words may serve me for an abiding rule of life. I left Spain a fugitive and penniless, but I have to-day received from my family a sum sufficient for my needs. You will allow me to send some poor Spaniard in my place. In other words, he seemed to me to say, this little game must stop. He rose with an air of marvellous dignity, and left me quite upset by such unheard-of delicacy in a man of his class. He went downstairs and asked to speak with my father. At dinner my father said to me with a smile, "'Louise, you have been learning Spanish from an ex-minister and a man condemned to death.' "'The Duke de Soria,' I said." "'Duke,' replied my father, "'no, he is not that any longer. He takes the title now of Baron de Macumer, from a property which still remains to him in Sardinia. He is something of an original, I think. Don't brand with that word, which with you always implies some mockery and scorn, a man who is your equal, and who, I believe, has a noble nature.' "'Baron de Macumer,' exclaimed my father, with a laughing glance at me pride kept my eyes fixed on the table. But, said my mother, Henares must have met the Spanish ambassador on the steps. Yes, replied my father, the ambassador asked me if I was conspiring against the king, his master, but he greeted the ex-grandee of Spain with much deference, and placed his services at his disposal. All this, dear Madame de l'Estorade, happened a fortnight ago, and it is a fortnight now since I have seen the man who loves me, for that he loves me there is not a doubt. What is he about? 
"'If only I were a fly, or a mouse, or a sparrow. "'I want to see him alone, myself unseen, at his house. "'Only think, a man exists to whom I can say, "'Go and die for me. "'And he is so made that he would go, at least I think so. "'Anyhow, there is in Paris a man who occupies my thoughts, "'and whose glance pours sunshine into my soul. "'Is not such a man an enemy, whom I ought to trample under foot? "'What? There is a man who has become necessary to me, "'a man without whom I don't know how to live? "'You married, and I in love. Four little months, and those two doves, "'whose wings erst bore them so high, "'have fluttered down upon the flat stretches of real life.' Sunday. Yesterday, at the Italian opera, I could feel someone was looking at me. My eyes were drawn, as by a magnet, to two wells of fire gleaming like carbuncles in a dim corner of the orchestra. Henares never moved his eyes from me. The wretch had discovered the one spot from which he could see me, and there he was. I don't know what he may be as a politician, but for love he has a genius." Behold, my fair René, where our business now stands, as the great Corneille has said. End of letter twelve. Read by Kara Schallenberg. www.kray.org. On January seventh, two thousand seven, in Oceanside, California.